Good afternoon. You're all very welcome to this webinar on the Fulbright Irish Awards application process. My name is Emma Lockney. I'm the Communications Manager with the Fulbright Commission in Ireland and I'll be taking you through the steps today, what's involved in putting an application together for 21-22. Um, there'll be an opportunity after my presentation to ask questions. Um, awardees can type their questions in the chat box. Um, we won't be able to hear you. It's a webinar, webinar format, but you can type any questions in the chat box and we'll try to get through as many as possible at the end of the session. Um, I'm joined today by my colleague, Fulbright Awards Manager, Paula Melvin, um, and she will be um, joining me for the Q&A sec section at the end. So, um, she can uh, uh, answer any kind of specific questions about the awards. So now, without further ado, I will take you through um, the presentation. Um, now hopefully you can all see um, the presentation now. So in terms of schedule, I'll go through the Fulbright program and eligibility criteria. Um, and then we'll talk about how to complete your application, including how to choose your award, the application content itself, um, the essays you'll need to write, and the review and interview process. Then we'll have plenty of time for Q&A, as I said. A little bit of background on the Fulbright programme, and this is really important because the Fulbright ethos will come up again and again in your application and if you make it to interview as well. So the, the Fulbright program uh, was set up by Senator J. William Fulbright in 1946, just after World War II. Um, Fulbright said that educational exchange can turn nations into people, contributing as no other form of communication can to the humanizing of international relations. Um, so the program is really about um, maximizing international relations, um, keeping channels of communications open. Um, so bear this in mind when you're putting together your research proposal, your application, um, think about kind of the, the wider um, aspect of, of your work and your study and what you want to do in the future in terms of um, uh, forwarding this message. The programme came to Ireland in 1957 um, and the commission was officially set up in 1991. And today the Fulbright programme is live in 180 countries worldwide. So it's a very large global network you'll be joining as an awardee. So the Fulbright opportunities are for passionate and accomplished students, scholars, artists, teachers and professionals. Um, in terms of students, um, you'll be applying for a postgraduate program, um, masters or part of a PhD or a full PhD. Um, and then for the scholars and professionals, I'll take you through more details on that when we look at the awards category. So the awards are open to all disciplines um, and you can choose to research, study, teach or lecture in the USA with these awards. The awards provide a monetary grant, visa administration, accident and emergency insurance, cultural and professional programming and ongoing support and links to a global network of Fulbright alumni. Um, all of our alumni have said that it's an experience of a lifetime. Um, this is not just for the period of time you're going to the US, which could be from anything, depending on your award category, for anything from two weeks up to 12 months, or if you're staying on for a PhD or master's, two years master's program, even longer. Um, but it's a lifelong um, experience in terms of joining the Fulbright community worldwide. There's also a lot of recognition with Fulbright um, name, especially in the US. So when you go to the US, um, when you're on campus, you're the Fulbrighter on campus. And this can mean an awful lot in terms of opening doors for you, um, meeting people, uh, especially even before that stage, um, when you're reaching out to US institutions to, um, you know, find somewhere to, to find somebody to collaborate with. Um, you know, if you say you're applying for a Fulbright Award, they will recognize the Fulbright name. They may not recognize your home institution here in Ireland um, or over in the US, but they will recognize the Fulbright name. So even at this early stage, um, it can open doors for you. And it's also a family. Um, the Fulbright alumni community here in Ireland is very engaging um, and worldwide as well. 
um, we, we do try and keep a, a very tight network of full writers, um, mentors and connections, both um, academic and professional networking. So you're really joining global peers through the program. To date, there's 390,000 alumni worldwide. Um, 2,500 of these would be, have been involved in the Irish-US exchange. Um, so to learn a little bit more from these alumni, they're a really great way to learn about the Fulbright ethos in particular, um, and also just to hear about the diversity of experiences that um, alumni have, have, have engaged with. You can watch our videos on our YouTube channel uh, we've had a number of webinars before this one, um, just from this year and from previous years. So please feel free to watch those back on YouTube as well. You can read their testimonials on our website. Um, they've also contributed articles to our annual reports. And you can always reach out to them for guidance. So on our website, you'll see that there are um, alumni listed for at least the last 10 years. So you can search through them to see if there's any who went to an institution you might be interested in visiting or who's in your field um, that you might like to write, reach out to and just let us know we'd be more than happy to put you in touch they're all very friendly and very enthusiastic to support and encourage new Fulbrighters. So in terms of eligibility um, these Irish awards are open to Irish citizens and EU citizens if you're an EU citizen you must have been resident in the Republic of Ireland for three or more years You'll need to demonstrate a strong rationale for where you're going in the US. This is particularly important, um, you know, if you're applying for a master's program or to do research, why is it that you need to go to the US to do this particular work uh, or study? Um, you know, why could it not be Europe or Ireland? Um, really think about this uh, and make a case, a strong case for it. Um, uh, and this will really help with your application. You must be willing to comply with the to your home rule visa requirement. So this means that after you go on your Fulbright Award, again, whether it's for two weeks or for 12 months, um, that you will come home afterwards um, and it's part of your visa requirement that you would not be able to uh, get a visa to uh, live or work in the US um, until you have filled this requirement. Now, that doesn't mean you can't go over for holidays or anything like that for visits. That's absolutely fine. It's just in terms of uh, working permit or, or um, living um, there more permanently. Um, of course, if you're doing more than a one year master's or, uh, you know, a longer PhD, perhaps um, you can stay on to do that, but the two year home rule will apply after you finish that. You can't be a dual US Irish citizen. You can't be living in the US at the time of application and you can't have recent extensive experience of studying or working in the US. So again, if you know you've gone on a J1 visa or something like that, don't worry about it. That doesn't make you does not make you ineligible. Um, it's only really if you've um, spent you know four out of five last um, years in the US studying or or living that you'd need to um, worry about that. So in terms of the application process, um, if you've joined us for other webinars, we'll have taken you through the timeline already, but I'll go over it now for those of you who haven't seen it. So the applications have been open since the 31st of August. The deadline is 2nd of November. Reviews will take place November to December. Um, and then if you're shortlisted for interview, you'll be called for that during January to February. And offers will be made in March 2021. So if you're applying this year, the earliest you'd go on your award is August 2021. Um, you can go later in the year if you so choose. In terms of planning, um, you're on the right on the right track watching our webinar today, um, but you will need to also review information on our website. Then you can choose your award, and I'll go through the categories now. Um, you need to find a course if you're applying for a taught course or plan your research proposal if you're going to do research um, and lecturing. You need to research what it means to be a Fulbrighter. Again, that Fulbright ethos understanding of that is key and then uh, register your interest if you haven't already. So you can visit our website um, to register your interest. That's kind of first port of call so you can receive the comprehensive Irish Fulbright guidelines and the online application link. 
So as I said, register your interest is key. That means our, you'll be in touch with our awards manager and that's really the first and most important step. Um, choose your award category. So there are five award categories. For Irish Student Awards, these are for postgraduate research or degree programs. The Scholar Awards then are for academic, professional research and or lecturing. The Tech Impact Awards are for academic, professional research with an ICT focus. Um, and the FLTA Awards are to teach the Irish language and take courses, while the Schumann Awards are for student and um, students and scholar, scholars, but they're run by the Belgian Commission um, and open to Irish and EU citizens. So I'll go through each of those award categories in a little bit more detail so you can understand what's involved with each. The student awards are for postgraduate students in all disciplines. Um, these are for visiting researchers or degree seeking students. Again, as I mentioned, if you're going to do a degree that's more than one year, that's fine. Fulbright will support your first year and then um, you could stay on um, with, with the college after that. You must establish affiliation or apply for a degree course. So if you're applying for a master's or PhD, you would be completing your application for the host institution at the same time really as uh, completing your Fulbright application. Um, if you're going to do research as part of a PhD program or independently, you need to establish inf affiliation with the host institution in the US. So you just need to reach out to those institutions you're interested in going to and um, make contact with them and, and get a letter of affiliation. This is not required by our 2nd of November deadline, but it is helpful to have a letter of affiliation um, as early as possible. So you should get started working on that. These awards are for a minimum of four months and a maximum of 12. And the maximum award amount is $35,000. So this will depend on how long you're going on the award for, where you're going. It's a monthly stipend and it's assessed um, on the MMR where you're going and how long you're going for. So for the scholar awards then, these are for postdoctoral professionals in all uh, postdoctoral researchers or professionals in all disciplines as well. You need to have a PhD or five years relevant professional experience. And important to note that you can have either, you know, um, professionals are very welcome to apply even if they do not have a, hold a PhD once they have five years experience. Um, these are to research and or lecture in the US. You need to establish affiliation with your US institution. And these are for a minimum of three months and maximum of 12. So the maximum award for scholars is a $40,000 uh, stipend. Um, and again, this is assessed on how long you're going and where you're going to. The Tech Impact Awards then are shorter term awards. These are for a minimum of two weeks and a maximum of three months. So they're significantly shorter than the other awards. Um, for these, they're kind of geared at early um, career professionals. Um, you must have a PhD or three to five years relevant professional experience. Preference is given to early career researchers, but if um, you're further down the line, I wouldn't let that put you off necessarily. Um, these are for non-commercial research exploring the transformative power of ICT. Um, so while you'd be needing to apply technology to whatever field you're in, again it is quite broad in terms of disciplines. You can be applying from any discipline once you're um, exploring ICT and how that's applied. For the FLTA awards then, these are to teach the Irish language and take classes at US colleges. Um, the award includes room, board, tuition, fees, stipend, travel and programming in the US. To be eligible for these you need to have a bachelor's degree, um, Irish language teaching experience as well as, um, as, well as fluency in the Irish language of course. Um, for these awards, you do not need to reach out to the host institution. We will match you with one of our partner institutions in the US. And these are for a maximum of 10 months duration. Those Schumann Awards that I mentioned um, are run by the Belgian Commission, uh, Belgian Fulbright Commission. Um, they're open to students and scholars um, and from, to Irish and EU citizens. Um, these ones if, you're, if your work has an EU or US focus, these ones would be relevant. The application period is slightly different. It's 15th of September to the 1st of December. So if you're interested in these awards, you can visit the Belgian Commission's website, 
Um, <clears throat> and please do let us know if you're planning to apply for one of these, just so we can monitor and make sure that your application goes through okay. Um, <clears throat> also worth um, noting that you can only apply to one commission per year. So you'll either be applying to the Irish Commission or the Belgian Commission. So you need to choose which category. So for those student and scholar awards that I mentioned and even the tech impact, they're open to all disciplines, okay? But within those categories, we have a number of sponsored awards. So these will be in targeted areas. So for example, we have sponsored awards with EPA in environmental kind of areas, um, ones in creativity with, um, with um, Creative Ireland. So have a look at these on our website. Um, look at the flyers because the um, criteria, criteria might be more specific um, than our general all discipline award. Um, so there's, I will go through a couple of those sponsored awards now just to, to let you know what I mean. Um, it's a quite simple step to apply for a sponsored award. It's just a, a, one extra form on your application. You just need to fill in which type of award you're applying for and why. Um, I would point out that if you're applying to the All Disciplines Awards, um, there'll be a large pool of people applying, you know, competitively with you. Um, whereas with these sponsored awards, because they're more niche, they're more specific to one field, um, you know, there might be less people applying in that particular pool. So um, it might be worth um, applying to that. There's also a specific fund allotted for each of these sponsored awards each year. So that's a list of the sponsored awards available. Some are available to students and scholars, some to students only, some to scholars only. The Fulbright Creative Ireland Professional Award is new this year. That's open to artists, writers, um, poets, musicians. Um, so it's definitely worth checking out. Um, and all of these flyers are available on our website now. So please do review them carefully. I'll touch on the LLM Awards. Um, these are, offer full and partial tuition waivers. Um, so the host institution in the US will offer either a full or partial tuition waiver for their course program. Um, if you're applying for a master's, you need to bear in mind, you know, that the course fees can be significant. So um, the Fulbright stipend may cover your living expenses, etc. But you'll need to work out how to cover your tuition. Whereas with these LLM awards, you're, you're also receiving a tuition waiver or partial tuition waiver from our partners in the US. So we have um, agreements with Mara School of Law, Notre Dame and with Penn. Again, those flyers are on our website and you can check out um, the criteria. For the Creative Ireland Museum Fellowships, so these ones are open to student category only. Um, they're specifically matched up with the Harry Ransom Centre, the Exploratorium or the Smithsonian. So you can choose one of those three host institutions. Um, and you just need to note that, again, specific eligibility criteria for each of these, you must seek a letter of support from the host and include that in your Fulbright application. So each of these flyers will have, um, give you advice on when you need to reach out, what date you need to reach out to the host institution by. Um, and so you can get that letter in time to include in your Fulbright application. In terms of asso associate awards, um, they're worth checking out as well. A number of US institutions offer um, tuition waivers um, to, to anyone who has been accepted to the Fulbright program. So if you're interested in any of these courses um, in Florida Poly or the University of South California, definitely worth checking out. Um, they do offer substantial um, waivers for Fulbright awardees. So for putting your application together, there are a number of things you'll need to prepare. Um, your personal information and CV will need to be included. There's also a personal statement of Fulbright's or Fulbright statement, depending on whether you're applying for student or scholar award, um, and a project statement. And I'll run through those essays now shortly. You'll need to have three recommenders. So these are your recommendations, um, your referees essentially. Um, and I would recommend to you to reach out to them as soon as possible. Um, they will need to submit your um, references to the online application system by the 2nd of November deadline. And they'll need to do that themselves. So you need to reach out to them 
um, through the application. Um, you can type in their email addresses. You don't have to have finished your application to send out the request to the recommenders. So do it as early as possible, first thing you do potentially. Um, and when you reach out to them, they'll receive instructions and they can send back their references to the online system. It's your duty to remind them to do this by the 2nd of November. And of course, um, lecturers are probably busier than ever at the moment. Um, you know, and academics will have a lot on their plate this year. So really make sure, you know, that, that they are aware of this and that they know they have to do it before 2nd of November. Um, because your application will be deemed ineligible if you don't have the three recommendations in. For student applicants, you'll need to include transcripts of your undergraduate college course and any masters if, if relevant. Um, you'll need a copy of your passport photo page. For artists, you'll need samples of your work. And then for, for students and scholars, um, you'll need a letter of affiliation. Um, again, this isn't essential to have by the 2nd of November deadline, but it's definitely very helpful to include in your application because it shows that you're organized, it shows that you've reached out to host institutions, that you're serious about your application. And um, of course, if you can you know, get a letter from your host to say that they'd be delighted to have you and that they can provide the support you need over there, um, it's a positive. Now, finding a host, some people um, don't know where to start with this. So we would say research experts in your field, of course, you know, just literally um, you know go through papers go through um, uh, academic research proposals um, <clears throat> and see you know who would you like to work with um, and you know be it as um, ambitious as you like with this um, even if you don't know them if you have no connections there's ways and means to reach out to them and a lot of our alumni have just reached out blind to um, to host institution contacts and have heard back you know sometimes they'll say they hear back from one or two out of ten sometimes they hear back from all of them depending on the quality of their research proposal and um, bear in mind that we welcome diversity in terms of organizations geography and background um, you can reach out to our irish and us alum as i mentioned you can see you know have our irish alumni gone to uh, an institution that you'd like to go to or have our US alum to Ireland on their award, um, are they in an institution that you'd like to go and visit? And they're all very open to chatting. So let us know if you'd like to reach out to them. You can use existing Fulbright links. So for instance, say you wanted to go to the Smithsonian, but say you're not eligible for the Creative Ireland um, Smithsonian uh, award, um, you can still you know, reach out to us and say, I'd like to go to the Smithsonian. Do you have a contact there? and we can put you in touch. Um, ask your mentors, of course, in your own colleges or in your own profession, um, you know, ask around. Um, people tend to have connections in the US and internationally, so you might um, benefit from that. And then select your degree or choose your HEI or your gallery that you want to go to. For your application, you'll have to do two, for the most part, you'll have to do two essays. So the FLTA awards are slightly different, but for the student and scholar awards, um, you'll need to write about your study research ob objectives. So you'll need to describe why your work is groundbreaking, your leadership qualities as well. These are really important parts of the application, okay? They want to know why you're passionate about your work uh, and what makes your work stand out. And um, again, that rationale for going to the US is really, really key. Who is it you want to work with? Um, you know, is it a lab you particularly want to go to? Um, that's cutting edge over in the US. Um, you need to identify the specific areas you will concentrate on. So, um, you know, really think about what work you're going to do and how you're going to break that down in terms of the amount of time you're there for. You need to identify your research questions and objectives, your methodology and your expected results or impact. So with these, we do like to see that you've broken these down, that you've really thought about them and you plan them out. If things should change when you're over there, you know, projects can evolve and that's absolutely fine. Um, we, we would understand that and expect that to some extent, but you do need to show that you've really planned it um, before going. And importantly, what impact will this have on your career and research and in your field in general as well? 
Then you have another essay and that's the personal statement or the Fulbright statement. And this is about you personally. So it's a self-assessment. It's talking about your personal and professional ambitions, your motivations and interests. So I suppose it's talking about what led you to this point while you're applying for a Fulbright. Um, we don't want you to rehash your study or research objectives. Um, so, so this is really about you and the qualities you will bring to the programme, any challenges you've overcome, um, you know, and what's gotten you to the point you're at today. It's also about what you hope to achieve in the US and upon your return, not just academically or professionally, but also culturally, personally. So you, you can actually talk about cultural uh, engagement that you wish to um, get involved in, whether that's sports, cinema, you know, arts, whatever it is to you, that's absolutely fine. What you hope to bring to the US and what you hope to bring back. So that can be, you know, state specific um, or more specific um, in terms of culture. And remember that, of course, this is an indication of your written communication skills. So highly recommend that you get somebody to proofread or a, a number of people to proofread your application, especially your essays. Then for the review and interview process, um, the review process, we have um, a panel and they will be experts in your field um, and they will be concentrating mostly on the, your academic record and your project statement, okay? Um, then they will also be taking into account um, elements of cultural engagement and leadership from your application. Um, so that cultural engagement and, and leadership is important even at the beginning. Um, but they, they will be assessing whether, you know, your rationale for going to the US is strong enough, whether your academic record is strong enough, and whether your proposal is original um, and relevant. Um, then if you're shortlisted to the interview stage, um, it flips around. Um, so your academic record and project statement have been approved by that point, and they're really concentrating on cultural engagement and leadership. So the interview panel will not be experts in your field. They will most likely be Fulbright alum um, or partners, and they'll be looking to see, you know, how you excel, um, your leadership qualities, how you plan to engage culturally. Um, for, these, um, for these interviews, again, you'll be, have to, you know, be able to explain your work clearly to people who are not experts in your field. So think about that element, you know, your elevator pitch as such. Um, all of that is very important, but the cultural engagement and leadership part is just really key to your application in general, but especially at this interview stage. So in terms of next steps, um, we'd recommend that you reach out to your recommenders firstly, um, you know, to give them notice uh, that you'll need them to submit uh, their references by 2nd of November. Select host institutions, so reach out to one or several host institutions that you're interested in going to. Um, we would recommend, you can reach out to as many as you want, but we would recommend that you have no more than two or three um, host institutions in the, you know, finalized um, for your visa. It just makes it less complicated. Um, research the Fulbright ethos, all of those things I mentioned, looking at the videos, um, looking at our webinars, chatting to alumni, I can't stress how, how um, positive uh, people have described the experience of chatting to alumni and preparing their applications. Um, so talk to a Fulbrighter and follow, uh, follow us on social media as well, on uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn and YouTube. And any queries can be directed to awards at fulbright.ie. So I'm gonna pull in um, our awards manager, uh, Paula Melvin now, um, and we'll get to answering a couple of questions here. So I'm um, just looking in the chat box, if everyone wants to write any questions they have in there, we'll, we'll try and get to as many as possible. So one a question is, I'm from India, studying masters in data science. Um, am I eligible to apply for scholarship? Where can I apply? So as I mentioned at the start, these Irish awards are open to Irish citizens and EU citizens who've been living in Ireland, Republic of Ireland for the last three years or more. So if that doesn't apply to you, then you need to probably apply to your home country, your country of citizenship. Um, 
Another question, this calls, oh, this calls awards must take place between August 2021 and is it July 2022? I think what you mean there probably is uh, what, the period of the award. Um, so yes, you can go anytime from August 2021 uh, to the following August. We recommend generally not going in the summer unless there's specific rationale for that, just because colleges can be closed um, and your engagement might not be as optimal. But if there's a reason you really want to go through the summer, you can reach out to Paul or the awards managers. Um, another question, can you only apply to one sponsored award each year? Yeah, Paula, do you want to talk a little bit about the sponsored awards um, by applying to one? No, that's literally just it. Um, you can only apply for one each year. Um, say, for example, if you're applying for the Chagas Award and Chagas don't feel that you're a good fit or if you just don't score as highly as someone else and they get the Chagas Award, you'll then be put into the all disciplines. So you're actually increasing your odds. So obviously, if you're applying against all disciplines, you're against people doing physics and maths and history, everything under the sun. Whereas if you're applying for a Chagas Award or any of the other sponsored awards, GSI, EPA, you're against a smaller pool. But if you apply for one of those awards and you're deemed unsuccessful for that award, you will then be taken into consideration for the All Discipline Award. So if you feel like you can apply for a sponsored award, please do. Okay, great, thanks Paula. Can or should one of the recommenders for the Irish Scholar Awards be the mentor in the host institution? I think that's, yeah, for, for Scholar Awards, you can have um, a recommender from your host institution. Um, you'll need to have one from your home institution unless you're a freelance, of course, which is fine as well. Um, you just have professional references in that case. Uh, now, next question. How much can we assume that people reading our project statement know about our field? So as I explained there towards the end, um, the review process will be as close to experts in your field as possible. So they will have quite, should have quite an idea about um, you know, your project, uh, the, the relevance of it, um, you know, whether it's groundbreaking or not. Um, and then when you come to interview stage, it will be a more general panel. So you'll need to be able to explain it um, as you would to myself or Paula, you know, who, who, who aren't experts in your field. Another question, I'm an Irish citizen living in Ireland for more than five years, but originally from Argentina, can I still apply here? So if you have Irish citizenship, yes, you can apply. Um, even if you're not living in Ireland, once you're not living in the US, you can apply as an Irish citizen living uh, anywhere in the world. I'm a first year PhD student studying at Harvard in the US. Am I eligible for the student scholarship? Paula, do you want to take that one? If you're ready in the United States, you're not eligible to apply. You must be resident in Ireland or normally resident of Ireland at the time of application. And um, additionally, say if you're just on holiday in the United States, that's fine. If you're already living and studying in the United States, then you're not eligible to apply. Thank you. Um, can you apply for a master's program in the US while already holding a master's degree from an Irish university? You can, of course, yeah. Um, generally, as Emma explained, um, students generally are people who are going to do masters and PhDs or part of their PhDs. Even if you're a scholar and you're a lecturer, who has multiple masters and a PhD, if you're going to do a master's, that's fine. It doesn't matter if you have several masters already. Great. Um, does the Fulbright Scholarship extend to Canadian universities? No, it's just to the United States. Um, so the Fulbright Awards are just to the United States. Another question. Have you any advice about whom to contact to be a recommender, past employer or who you would advise having? So we touched on that a little bit briefly. Anything else to add on that, Paula? Um, it's also worth just noting, and um, you explained very well, Emma, um, about your three recommenders that you need to register. The website, I believe, the new system will allow you to register between one and five, but it has to be three. And you actually get an email when they have actually submitted for you. So keep an eye on that and definitely keep an eye on your junk, just in case we send you the instructions and it goes into mm -hmm. junk or just place that email from IAE, the automated email, when they submit the reference for you. Just keep an eye on that. Yeah. And equally, actually, you know, if your recommenders don't receive an email, get them to check their spam folder as well, because a lot of the university email addresses will have, you know, high security and it might go in straight into junk or spam mail. So it's worth um, thinking about that. Um, somebody said, my Viva has been delayed. It should be complete mid end October. Can I still apply? So I suppose this is, there. there is a kind of limbo stage between finishing your PhD and where you would 
if you're applying to go to um, the US on a Fulbright award, as part of your PhD, you go as a student award category. Whereas if you've already got your PhD, you're going as a scholar award category. Um, so if you're finishing up your VUA, you've already submitted, so you can't apply as a student or D anymore. So you'll be applying as a scholar. Um, and I think, yeah, it's fine if you, if you haven't done uh, your VUA um, to date, but you'll need to have done that by time of approval or time of offer um, so we can see that everything is, is done. Um, I suppose this year is a little bit different to other years because there's lots of delays and everything. So, um, you know, reach out to us with specific questions about that um, again, because we, we don't know what will happen in the next few months, I suppose. Are the experts drawn from international panels or Irish? Is this process anonymous? Well, do you want to take that one? Yes, the process is anonymous. So you will not know who um, reviewed your application. But as Emma said, um, the at the review period after you submit on November 2nd. My colleague Sonia and I were both the two awards managers. We check all applications for eligibility and then we source recommenders. So it's three recommenders. We try to get a gender balance and a balance between at least recommenders from Ireland and the United States, perhaps other countries as well. But we do try, say if you're applying from UCC or you've done your master's in UCC and your PhD in UCD, we'll avoid those host institutions and try to find other experts in your field who aren't your referees and aren't already mentioned in your applications and who don't work in your host institutions. So at times, if you're working in a very specific field, we will most definitely try and source full writers who went to France or different countries and we'll do our best to find three expert referees who are unbiased, who do not know you, to review your application. Um, and also, um, yes, it is totally uh, anonymous. And then obviously on the day of the interview, if you're called to interview, you will find out on the day who are interviewing, but like Emma said, um, it's also um, kind of, it's not really about your project as much on, on the interview day. It's, there won't be experts in your field necessarily. So there might be say one person in science, one person in, uh, in literature, one person in history, whatever it is, it will be a mix, probably not experts in your field. Yeah, thanks Paula. Um, for the Creative Ireland Fellowships, how important is having previous academic research my research may be more creative than academic. So that really depends on the award. Some of the host institutions between Smithsonian Exploratorium and Harry Ransom Centre have specifically outlined that they want somebody who's doing a PhD or they want somebody with a master's. So have a look at those flyers and just check which ones are relevant to you. If um, those kind of guidelines that they give are too rigid, for yourself you can always apply to the all disciplines award so don't let it put you off um because they're you know the all disciplines awards are definitely open to artists and creatives who wouldn't have necess you know who may not have the academic background um so the, if the sponsored awards aren't suitable for you just have a look at the um all discipline are you allowed to utilize additional small financial support from host university in us if, if it's available Yes, can I jump in on that? Um, yeah, I do. So, and like Emma said, when you're contacting your host institution in the United States, they may not be familiar with your host institution in Ireland, but they will be familiar, or odds are they will be uh, familiar with Fulbright. Sometimes students have been lucky enough that they apply for the Fulbright, they get the Fulbright, and when the host institution in the States sees that they've gotten the Fulbright, they sometimes offer an additional scholarship. That has happened in my four years as a Wars Manager of Fulbright. It has happened a couple of times to Irish students. So. Definitely, uh, because it's also in the host institution in the United States' best interest to host Fulbrighters because when they're ranking institutions in America, they do actually take consideration how many Fulbrighters they attract and how many Fulbrighters they send out. So definitely, that is a possibility. Great, thank you. Is it possible to apply for a Fulbright scholarship if it's to American University, but the master's course is in their satellite campus in the EU? You must be Did based... You you must be based in the United States and similarly it's the same for Americans who want to apply to Trinity but the course is actually based in Belfast or in some other campus somewhere else. You must be based in the United States. Obviously at the moment um, at the moment, um, things like someone might start a course remotely from the moment due to the COVID situation but hopefully that will not apply to you because obviously this uh, webinar is for people who are applying to go to the United States in the academic year 2021-2022. I'm applying for a Tech Impact Award and I'm, I have a good existing relationship with the host institution. Um, this area is specifically cybersecurity. Should I reconsider and go with a sponsored award? Um, 
I think uh, for if you're applying to the Tech Impact, um, Tech Impacts in a way are like a sponsored award because there's a specific fund set aside for a number of Tech Impacts each year. So you wouldn't necessarily need to get any more specific than that in terms of going for a sponsored award. Um, again, the, the timeline is different. Tech Impact is much shorter, two weeks to three months whereas the, the Scholar Award is uh, three months to 12 months. So that's really gonna be a key difference in you know, your proposal in what you wanna do. Um, if you already have a good relationship with the host institution, that is good, of course, because you, know, you have a starting point, but you do need to demonstrate what's new about the research you're doing. So if there's already an exchange going on you know, every year um, or more regularly even, um, the panel and the reviewers are going to want to see what's new about your proposal. Um, so, so make sure you know you're bringing in new elements, and it's not just a continuation of something because that's not what Fulbright's for. It's kind of to establish <clears throat> new collaborations, um, you know, and support um, you to to uh, develop your network. Um, somebody said, "I'm not clear how applying for two host institutions work. Can you say more?" Um, so that's just basically that some of our awardees have wanted to go to more, have wanted to kind of spread their award across uh, more than one institution. So they might want to lecture, for instance, in one institution and then go and do research in another library or different institution. So they can do that, but really three is the absolute maximum. We'd recommend, you know, one where possible, but three is the absolute maximum because otherwise for your visa it just becomes complicated and can i just hop in just in case i'm misreading that question if in terms of say if you're a student who is going to apply to two or three different host institutions to do an llm that is also totally fine and because obviously you can apply to go to any third level institution in the united states and there are several thousand of them obviously the deadlines for each university don't exactly line up perfectly with our deadlines of November 2nd and so on. And um, so it, it has happened that I've had the wonderful experience of ringing LLM students in particular in March, congratulating them saying you've been awarded the Fulbright Award, but they don't actually get accepted to the post institution until May. So this happens every year and we totally understand that and that is fine. So if you're applying to two, two, two countries, if you're applying to the United States with two host institutions to do an LLM, that is fine. Yeah. And I suppose as well, Paula, um, in terms of, um, you know, putting, say, you do have three top choices for your master's or your LLM, um, in terms of your essay, then when you're planning it, would you have any advice, you know, whether it is to talk about, I suppose, the programmes have to be similar enough because, if, you know, if you're applying for three completely different programmes in the States, even if it's within law, um, you know, it won't show really that, that, you know, that you're passionate about a specific area. Say, for example, exactly, say, for example, if you're interested in human rights law, it makes sense to apply to three LLMs in human rights law across the United States. So it doesn't make sense to do, I don't know, copyright law or, and then human rights law and whatever business law. Generally, three similar and then your essays kind of make sense because, like Emma said earlier on, it has to be a strong rationale to go to the States. So it has to be these three universities offer this type of LLM that isn't done in Ireland or there's generally speaking though people do hone their essays to more so be about their top choice so as in I want to go here for this lecture because you need that strong rationale to go to the United States it can't just be oh I want to go to the States for 10 months it has to be this lecture this thing I can't do that in Ireland and I want to bring this information back to Ireland or in terms of if you're a scholar as in definitely um, we do this really well in in, in Ireland and I want to bring this knowledge to the United States as a lecturer or, or whatever. Great. Um, can you es uh, explain again how to establish affiliation? So you, you basically just need to reach out and ask for a letter of affiliation if you're going to do research. If you're going to do a st to study on a programme, you don't need to get that letter of affiliation because you're applying to the course and we will see, you know, pending um you know your award will be offered pending acceptance to that uh, course or one of the courses you've listed so but anything else on the on the letter of affiliation paula um ideally if you can have dates that the person would say i'm willing to host um emma lockney uh, from the period of september 1st to october or whatever the dates are um ideally that'd be fantastic if it can, it can um, incorporate that Ideally, as enthusiastic as the person can be about hosting you is beneficial, but um, not necessary. 
Um, we will not penalise, people do not get penalised for not having a letter of affiliation. Like I previously said, especially for things like LLMs, we accept that the acceptance from those, the deadlines for those institutions may be actually after we even offer the awards to students and scholars. So you will not be penalised for not having it, but if you can have it, it is beneficial. Um, especially for research or lecturing, it shows that you're planning. And also sometimes, you know, if you do have that kind of host, um, for them to see your research proposal and see what you're planning, sometimes they'll give you feedback and say, oh, well, you know what? Um, we actually have this amazing resource that you haven't mentioned and we'd love for you to, to take a look at that, to, you know, research that. Or we have, if you're interested in doing lecturing, you know, we have this course and we'd love to get you involved. So that kind of interaction can really help you put your application together in the first place as well. Okay, we have loads more questions, so I'll try and get through um, a good few in the next, um, we have about 10 or 15 minutes left. As a current PhD student, the website says priority is given to visiting research is in late stages of PhD. When do you recommend going? How does this work with writing up, etc.? cetera? Paula, do you want to take that one? Well, generally people wouldn't go in their first year. I think a lot of people that try to go for their second or ideally their third year because they have X amount of their PhD done and their work done. Whereas if you go in the fourth year, it wouldn't be particularly extremely beneficial, in my opinion, because you're already, you've most of the work done, you're pretty much writing it up. So I'd say third year if it's a four year PhD. Yeah, and as well, just to avoid that time, you know, you, you can go at, towards the end of your PhD, but you have to make sure if you're going as a student or wordy that your Fulbright research is con is contributing to your PhD, you know, so it doesn't make any sense to go after you've submitted, but before you've kind of graduated or before you've um, done your Viva, um, because that's the kind of middle stage that you're neither a student or a scholar. What kind of extensions are Fulbright planning in terms of COVID restrictions on travel? So I suppose for this year, um, you know, we have lots of things implemented, but for next year, as Paula says, hopefully circumstances will be different. Um, we don't have a crystal ball, so we can't predict that. Um, we will be, you know, with great advice from the US Fulbright Programme, and we work very closely with our um, partners, the Department of Foreign Affairs here, and the Department of State in the US. So we follow advice from them, and the awardee safety is obviously um, our primary concern. So. That's something we, we, we will um, take into account as we go, um, but hopefully by this time next year, um, people will be able to, to travel. Anything else on that, Paula? Paula's really, been dealing um, with everything. We are very awardy centric or awardy focused, in my opinion. Um, obviously, when COVID kind of hit its peak, kind of, or when it became a big news story in March, um, we gave the option to all Irish scholars in the States and vice versa, the Americans in the States and the Irish, that both sides were given the option of staying or going, returning home or staying in their host country. And we supported whatever the awardees wanted. And like Emma said, we work closely with the US Embassy, with Fulbright in the United States, the Institute of International Education and with our different partner organizations. And we, 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 we try to be as flexible as, as possible and put your needs first. And hopefully, if, yes. <laughs> hopefully your awards will not be affected anyway by COVID come academic 2020. Thank you. Um, what would a student going for four months also have to pay fees in the home, institu in the home institution? Um, if you're talking about your home institution as in where you're studying at the moment or where you're doing your PhD, that's completely between you and your home institution. Um, I suppose uh, in terms of the host institution, you should check really that they don't have research fees attached because um, some universities would have um, research fees. That's in your experience, has that been the case for students, Paula, or just for students? I've, I've never actually been asked that question. Therefore, I presume they don't because it hasn't been an issue before. But like Emma said, I do imagine that's more so a question for UCD or DKIT or wherever your host institution or your home institution in Ireland is. Yeah, and worth checking out with the host institution or especially when you're shortlisting which host institutions, whether they have research fees. Some of the very well known universities in the US may have universe, or research fees attached. Again, mention that you're going to apply on a Fulbright award may make a difference, you never know. Um, are there also general LLM awards, um, not just the sponsored ones, Myra Penn and Notre Dame 
yep, you can apply for LLM in any university you like. You just need to bear in mind the tuition fees um, and the award, the maximum award we offer for student awards. Um, you know, that's maximum $35,000. And if your tuition fees for the year are fifty to $60,000, you need to plan how you're going to work with that. And then at that stage, it's also mentioned in the instructions. So like Emma said, it can be very costly to do an LLM if you don't get a few waiver in the States. So when I'm working with the US Embassy and the colleagues in the States to prepare your visa, you may be asked to pro provide proof of funds for 50 grand or something like that. Yep. Can you apply this year to go to the US in late 2021, early 2022? Um, yeah, you can. So you can go anytime between August 21 and August 22. As we mentioned, going in the summer is um, not particularly encouraged unless there's a specific reason why you need to go in the summer. Um, uh, that's because one, um, if you're going to a campus, there may not be that many people on campus to support you. Uh, and two, we do expect you to attend our award ceremony and orientation in June. Would a student going for four months, also, oh, sorry, I've already read that one. Um, if you have current funding as a PhD student, can you apply for the Fulbright Scholar Award, how does this sit with current funding? Um, well, firstly, if, you if you're doing a PhD, you're applying as a student award category. Um, and yes, many people have been funded by Irish Research Council or another funding body um, when they apply and they can get the Fulbright additional research once, or research funding, um, once their other funders don't have any issue with it, once there's no crossover on the specifics of um, what you plan to do in the States. Another uh, question, I'm Irish studying in Dublin and I live in the Netherlands, should I apply through the Irish Awards? You're eligible to apply through the Irish Awards um, if, you, if you wish. Um, just to bear in mind, you can, if you're eligible for, eligible for the um, Dutch Awards, you can only apply to one in any given year. Do you have any advice on selecting the current sponsored awards based on the project proposal? There are two sponsored ones that would apply to my research. Paula, do you want to take that one? You know your research better than we do. So if you're torn between, I don't know, EPA and Chagas, really, I'd perhaps research both websites and perhaps even reach out to Chagas and imagine, could this work for you? And um, But really, and also talk to your colleagues in your department in whatever, where you're doing your PhD or wherever you work, because really you actually know your research much better than we do. So you'll be, you're actually the best person to determine that yourself and your PhD supervisor or your colleagues in your department. Um, okay, um, just a few ones I think we've already kind of touched on there. Should I jump in here? There's one here, even yeah. though you can apply to two or three LLMs, is it better to just apply for one? Does this increase your chances of getting Fulbright? I would actually advise you to apply for two or three LLMs um, just in case. Um, it doesn't decrease your odds. Um, but say, just hypothetical situation, say you only apply for one LLM, and you get the full right, but you do not get a place on that course, then you cannot take up your full right award because you've missed all deadlines properly to apply. You may have missed all deadlines to apply for any other um, a course that offers an LLM. And I do appreciate there may be a fee to apply to an LLM course and whatnot. It may be extra work, but it's definitely worth it. Um, does Fulbright help with visa applications? Yes, yeah, so we, we provide uh, administration support for the visas and we'll arrange um, for your interviews. Paula, do you want to touch on anything else on that? Yes, we do indeed. And um, you just have to, when we email you, myself and Sonia, um, hopefully in March, saying congratulations, um, we give you instructions and we give you deadlines. So we expect the medical to be completed at least six weeks before your departure date and we'll help you along with all of that. And I suppose just important to mention in case anybody missed it as well, that two-year home rule, really important part of the visa. So you're not applying for a visa to go and live in the States, you know, permanently or longer than your award, um, unless specifically you're going to do a master's that's two years or a PhD or something like that. Um, you know, that two-year home rule does apply. So that's an important part of your visa interview as well, you know, demonstrating that you understand that. Um, so if your intention is to go and apply, do the Fulbright and stay in the United States for the rest of your life, then Fulbright, unfortunately, is not for you. Yeah. 
yeah, it's about knowledge exchange and bringing it all back to Ireland. And of course, developing that network that, you know, in the future, if you do want to continue or work more permanently in the US, that's of course up to you, but for the two year home rule is, is quite rigid. Um, sorry if I missed it, but what is the success rate for scholar awards? Um, I suppose each year we might have for the all discipline scholar awards, anything you know, up to a hundred people submitting, um, completing their application, a lot more inquiries obviously, but um, you know, it's, it's hard to measure um, how the success rate as such, because with those sponsored awards, you know, there'd be less people applying to each of the sponsored awards. All disciplines are obviously the most popular. Um, so um, yeah, generally um, we would have, I, I would say up to about 100 um, people each year applying for the Scholar Awards. Um, should your recommenders focus on your pro professional and personal qualities? Yeah, I think so. Um, and also the kind of innovative nature or anything, you know, the rationale behind your project and what it means for you know, Ireland and, and internationally as well, how relevant it is, would be very important. Anything on that, Paula? Yeah, because Fulbright, like, like you kind of Fulbright is about the greater good. It's not just about your academics. You could have gotten two ones and first class honours all, all along. It's not purely about that. If you're not going to kind of contribute to the greater good and if you're not talking about anything, we don't want to send people who are just going to work in a lab in North Dakota or work in a lecture hall and won't in, engage with community outside of the lecture hall or outside the lab. That's exactly what Fulbright is not about. So I think they should talk about your academics and you as a person. Definitely. Okay. A uh, question here, just can I email Paula um, after the session? Yeah, of course, you can email awards at fulbright.ie with the very specific questions. Uh, we have time to just only take a few more now. So if we haven't answered your question by the end of this session, please do email Paula or Sonia at awards at fulbright.ie and they'll get back to you as soon as possible. Um, obviously, as we come up to the deadline, 2nd of November deadline gets very busy. So if you have questions, ask them as soon as possible um, and they'll try and get back to you within three working days. Um, now, anything else here? Um, can I apply to do creative research in two different museums within the Smithsonian? Yes, I think that's uh, possible. You just need to discuss with um, the contact you're reaching out to um, whether it's possible from their end, but I can't see an issue. Um, who cannot be a recommender? Um, I would say family members. <laughs> cannot be <laughs> um, yeah, so you know yourself, professional or academic um, recommenders. Sorry, can I just hop in? I think there's a really good one yeah. about, um, can I bring my husband and my children for visas? If you're going as a tech impact or a student or a scholar, you can, of course. Um, we unfortunately do not have the funding to fund your spouse and your children. If you're going as an FLTA, you're not allowed to bring dependents purely because you're generally in a lot of the institutions giving accommodation, so it doesn't work from that end. But for most of the wards, yes, you can. If your children and your spouse are only going to visit you for a short, short period of time, or if you're going for a tech impact, two to two weeks to three months, you may be better off just going down the ESTA route, but we will talk you through it. Thanks. Um, and then uh, so how many candidates are successful each year? So um, we've had in, the, in recent years, generally between 35 to 40 um, successful Irish awardees going out. Uh, again, you know, success rates, um, you know, we, we don't give statistics that much because five to 10 of them could be FLTAs going to teach Irish awards, um, you know, 10 to 12 of those or more could be sponsored awards. And then between the all disciplines, it could be, you know, only 12, you know, 12 or 16. So um, again, it depends on what award category you're applying for. The all disciplines is definitely the biggest pool of, of applicants. But also say if the people who kind of come first or the top scoring people in all disciplines, if they all want to go for three months or four months, we're in a position to fund more people because obviously you get a smaller stipend the less time you go on. It's done according to the time period. Whereas if the top candidates are all applying to go for 10 or 12 months, we can only fund less people because they cost more to fund. Yeah. And I wouldn't let that influence how long you apply to go for it. You know, you need to go for what's right for your research proposal. You'll have your timeline in there to explain the rationale behind that. Um, but yeah, as Paula says, it depends each year on the amount of time 
the, 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 the top ranking people want to go for um, that will allow us to fund uh, more and how many of those I suppose are applying for the sponsored awards or the all discipline awards too. So um, I think that's the majority of the questions. Um, was there any other questions you saw, Paula, that you think um, we could, we need to answer? Oh, well, to be honest with you, I wasn't expecting this amount of questions. So yeah. I'm sure we did actually skip a few and we obviously didn't have time. But like you said, um, if people want to uh, email awards at fullbright.ie, that's fullbright one l Myself and Sonia will get back to your queries. Yeah, there's just one more I saw there. Do I have to have a contract with the Research Institution Ireland if I want to apply for a Fulbright EPA award? Um, just check the flyer because again, some of the sponsored award flyers specify that they're looking for a PhD students or they're looking for professionals or they're looking for like, um, you know, somebody affiliated with the host institution or home institution. Um, generally, it, in the all discipline awards, if you're if you're kind of freelance um, or associated with an institution, it doesn't make too much of a difference. Um, but for some of the sponsored awards, they specify that they're looking for somebody um, at a certain career level or you know um, certain certain uh, criteria like that. So just check out that um, flyer to be certain. Okay. Um, thanks to everybody now who's se sending in. Uh, there, thanks. Um, so, as Paula said, if you do have any more questions, um, our awards managers are here to take your uh, queries um, sooner rather than later, I would say, just so you have, um, you know, the, the best amount of time to prepare your application. We don't generally do um, calls because of the volume of queries that come in, so please do email. Um, and if you want to watch back any of our other webinars, we've had a series of webinars. This is the last one, um, but we've had kind of discipline specific uh, webinars up to now. They're all available on our YouTube channel. It's Fulbright Ireland. We also have a number of um, videos from alumni, uh, just short videos um, about their experience on that YouTube channel and then older videos from previous years, uh, interviews with Fulbrighters. And they're all really helpful in terms of finding out about that Fulbright ethos um, you know the rationale be behind going and really what the experience meant to people and um, because it is so much more than just an academic or professional um, award it is a cultural award and people really especially those who are very proactive when they go get an awful lot out of it so it's worth thinking about those elements that you know you you'll enjoy when you go over so thanks to everyone for joining us today. Um, the email address once more, just in case you didn't catch it, awards at fulbright.ie. Um, and we very much look forward to working with you over the coming months now um, in preparing your application and wish you all the best of luck. So thank you and thank you to Paula for joining me for all the questions today. Thanks everyone, have a good day.